So where I'm stood right now is one of those small places that if you come to Normandy and you're on the N13, which is the main north-south road through here, you could well miss it. But this whole area saw some incredibly intense fighting on D-Day and D plus one. And its story is still relatively, relatively untold. This is the story of La Barquette Locks, the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment and their actions around here on D-Day. So La Barquette Lock is uh, a lock gate and uh, a small series of buildings that were placed here to control the flow of the Douve River to and from the marshy areas and then out toward the sea. The Germans had uh, obviously been here for a number of years by the time D-Day rolled around and they understood its importance that of it being a strategic crossing point over the Douve River, which is a very wide river, especially if you've not got any bridging equipment, and it's also pretty fast flowing. The other strategic important point about the locks itself was that they could be raised or lowered at the Germans' whim, and if needed, they could be opened so that they could just flood the marshy area behind uh, the locks themselves and cutting off the uh, routes to and from Carantan and uh, saint com du mont The Americans and the planners for D-Day also knew this, and as such, the task of capturing it and holding it on D-Day itself was assigned to the 1st Battalion of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment. Under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Carroll, he was tasked with assembling his men Bringing, bringing them to this position from drop zone D, which is basically that whole area uh, behind me. To bring them here, clear out the German defenders, which at the time was the elements of the 3rd Battalion of the 1058 Grenadier Regiment, which was part of the 91st Luftland Division. And they would take hold this area and then with... Uh, 3rd Battalion of the 506 further down the Douve River with the bridges over at Laporte and Brevons, that this whole area as well as those troops um, toward Ongavillo Plain it would all be linked up and they would be able to uh, secure this area and enable freedom of movement for the US troops uh, in and around the area and then as the uh, plan was to push south to Carantan and link up the two bridgeheads. So, like a lot of plans on D-Day, this one didn't go to plan. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lieutenant Colonel Carroll was killed uh, during the drop. And as all the paratroopers were widely misdropped, uh, the 1st Battalion itself wasn't able to assemble its force and move as a cohesive unit to this location. However, uh, there was some good fortune. As we know, Jumpy Johnson, uh, the commanding officer of the 501st Regiment, landed at Chateau Bellano, which is about 900 meters in that direction. It's not very far, um, although far enough at night, admittedly, when you've got elements of the gym, uh, Jäger around, and you're also disorientated from the drop. However, Johnson, and uh, another notable individual, Lieutenant Farrell, who was a forward observer with the US Navy, who had dropped in with the 501st. They managed to assemble a force of approximately 150 men and they moved to this location. Now, when they arrived, Johnson decided the best course of action would be to keep approximately 100 of his men as a reserve force, while he would send 50 of his men forward to take the lock itself, take the buildings and clear out any German positions on the south side of the bank. The, uh, the members of the 1058 regiment that were billeted here didn't put up much resistance, although there was some exchange of fire, but it was pretty light. 
So with the German positions cleared out on the south side, Johnson then set about digging in his men and starting to defend this area. As the day developed, they started to come under withering fire from German artillery, from mortars, and from small arms fire as well. And thanks to Lieutenant Farrell being able to recover his radio after the jump, which was fairly miraculous in itself, given the amount of equipment that was lost um, with, the, uh, with the troops that jumped, he was able to call in the USS Quincy and bring to bear its eight inch guns upon the suspected German firing points. He was so effective in this that he was actually able to not, not completely silence the Germans, but to greatly lessen the, the effect of their fire during that time. So as the situation developed here on the 6th and 7th of June, Johnson was in desperate need of support and believed that the strategic importance of the locks here at La Barquette far outweighed that of securing the ground around uh, saint Comte du mont So with that in mind, he put a radio call through to Ballard, who was fighting up around um, Ongervillo Plain and uh, Le Bas Adville and that, that area. And obviously his troops were heavily engaged at the Ferme de Lorny, as we've seen in a in a previous episode and at the time when Ballard got the call he basically said to Johnson no I can't the force uh, we're too heavily engaged the force between us and um, the enemy forces is just too, far too uh, far too great and I can't move my troops to your location it was a real shame because that did lead to a uh, deepening resentment between the two because Johnson felt that he the Ballard had let him down which clearly wasn't the case but in the heat of the moment it must have been uh, incredibly difficult to understand why one of your battalion commanders wouldn't follow your your order and to bring more men to what is clearly one of the more strategically important locations. So following on from the fighting at La Barquette, June the 7th would see a day where the Six Fauschenjäger would really be tested and ultimately see a great number of their force reduced. So if you want to stick around for that, that's in the next video. Um, however, if you've enjoyed this, please like, comment and subscribe. It's always greatly appreciated and I'll see you in the next one.